Secondly, run a mean pick six. What does that mean? You don't run a pick six. It doesn't make any sense. I guess it's a good thing football fans weren't watching. Didn't he coach football? So we asked both campaigns, what were you thinking? Banfield starts now. Welcome to Monday. Good to have you here. Thanks for being here watching the show. Uh, there has been something in the in the trial of Richard Allen um, that has been bothering me. Some people refer to it as the Delphi murder trial, but two little girls were murdered violently and viciously in a hands-on killing. Their throats were slashed. They were forced to strip naked. They were dead on the ground. That is hands-on murdering. So you would think there'd be DNA everywhere, right? Hands-on, not a gunshot fired from 10 feet away. And yet we find out today there's none. There's, there's just n- n- nothing, nothing that links, no DNA of Richard Allen, nothing. No DNA to anyone else either. So What happened out in those woods? How could that have been hand-to-hand combat almost? Given the fact they're kids, I'm sure they didn't fight back. But where would the evidence be? There should be DNA. We're going to talk about that. And also today we learned there was something on Abby's face. And it gives us a bit of a window into what was happening as she was being murdered. The Sarah Boone case, if you missed it on Friday night, you might have been out. I get it. But... Boy, that jury came to a decision fast, (laughs) under two hours. I expected it. Um, But do you suppose she's got some regrets? You know, because three weeks earlier, she'd been offered 15 years, and now she's guilty of the top charge with a minimum of 22.5. And by the way, that doesn't mean she's going to get the minimum. I mean, she could get more than that. Her lawyer is with me tonight. I can't wait to ask how she took the news when she heard that read in court, that guilty verdict. And then this is, uh, this is a whole new area, a whole new space that, that we don't even have laws to cover yet. If you are a fan of Game of Thrones, you are one of many, many millions. And I get it. I was too. It's over, right? On HBO, Game of Thrones is over. But it still lives on for a lot of fans, in chat bots and AI. You can just engage with any old character and have full-on conversations with, like, any of the lead characters, right? Daenerys, Targaryen, yeah, I can have a chat with her. The trouble is, so can kids. And one kid did and fell in love. And it led to his suicide. So his family is suing. But who do you sue? It's a bot. And did the company create that problem? Are they guilty in any way of this? It is so interesting. This is a civil suit. What about criminal? I mean, when you hear the lawyer for the family suing, I think you're going to get a big insight as to where we are in this very new universe. Let me start here, though. If you plan it out thoroughly enough and you carry it out carefully enough, if you have good enough control of your surroundings and, of course, control of your victim. And if you're really, 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 really lucky, you just might be able to pull off the perfect murder without leaving any trace of yourself behind. Maybe. I doubt many can do this, but I am still trying to wrap my head around what we learned in court today during Richard Allen's trial. The state says he killed Abby Williams and Libby German while they were on a walk in the woods back in 2017, Delphi, Indiana. And the murder was violent, up close and personal. The girls were forced to undress and their throats were slit. So you would expect the crime scene investigators would find a trove of DNA from the killer, given how hands-on these murders were. But a DNA analyst for the state took the stand today and basically said there, there wasn't a trace. There just wasn't a trace of Richard Allen anywhere near where those girls were found. Not a trace, nothing genetic pointing to that defendant. And you know what else? There wasn't a trace pointing to anyone else either. There just wasn't a trace. There was no DNA linking any violent killer to these two girls. And again, this was the prosecution witness. 
she was on the stand, and she went on to say that rape kits were performed on both of these girls. No semen was found. No other evidence of sexual assault was either. And we had assumed as much, really, when they didn't bring sex charges against Richard Allen. But this, honestly, in court, on the stand, was the first public confirmation of it. The analyst said that some male DNA did turn up in a few of the samples, but it was a trivial amount. Before you say, wait, hold on, um, DNA experts said it could have come from, you know, living in a house with men or boys. Very, very, very small, to the point where it almost couldn't be tested. And then, what about those strands of hair that were found in Abby's hand? That sounded huge when the defense brought that up in opening statements, right? The analyst said it belonged to Libby's sister. We'll get to that in a minute. I have some questions. We also heard today from a prosecution blood pattern expert who suspects that Libby was dragged while she was bleeding out. But then again, in a strange twist, Abby was not. He also told the court that Abby's hands were against her chest and had absolutely no blood on them which is amazing since both girls died when their throats were cut. And you know the natural reaction, right? Think about it. It happens to you, you're shocked. Your reaction would be to reach up and hold your now very bloody neck. The witness on the stand said, maybe an answer for that. Abby probably was either restrained or unconscious when her killer slit her throat. I want to stop here and bring in Susan Hendricks, longtime TV journalist, colleague of mine, author of Down the Hill, My Descent into the Double Murder in Delphi. She was in Mm -hmm. the courtroom uh, today. Susan, what tough stuff to to sit through today. Um, And I want you to bring to the attention of our viewers what I found to even be sadder. Mm -hmm. Evidence on Abby's face of what she was going through, likely um, just before or during her murder. Yeah, Ashley, and the way you laid it out and you said it's baffling, it was to me too. And I'm in the front row about, I don't know, two feet from Richard Allen, the suspect, the man on trial. And it was really the first time I got an up-close look at the crime scene photos. And I'm in really close, Ashley, and zooming in to Abby's face. And at times I, I turned away. But so the gentleman who was on the stand, Major Patrick Cicero, blood expert, I heard him once before the end of July during a hearing, but he was up on the stand and he was questioned by the prosecution and he was asked about Libby's face and they zoomed in on it and she had blood kind of flowing across her face, dripping. And you notice they blacked out her eyes, but you notice one was kind of lighter, I guess a strip of blood, if you will. And he said, what that aligns with is without the presence of water or rain is a tear. And I know that people say this. They describe it as gasps. There was in the courtroom. And I think I was one of them. I mean, it was heart-wrenching. And Libby's family, of course, Abby's too. But Libby's, her grandmother said to me personally, I hope she didn't suffer through the years. And I always say, "I, I think it was quick. That's what they said. You hear a tear, you think suffering. And I looked over at the jury, and they were upset too. So just so many difficult times in court and right with the DNA expert she was on the stand out of the gate her name was Stacy Botanitsky um and she went through different um items actually so it wasn't a quick on the stand at all like the gray bra lab number 32 listing black bra lab number 33 so it's listing and you're thinking okay there's going to be a match and then they said an unidentified male uh for a few items and then well what were the results and again like you said state witness and she said Um, It was a gentleman from the lab. So then you think, okay, contamination. So, of course, that's not good for the state. And then, of course, we heard from Cicero, who took us through exactly what they think. And Abby's hands, Ashley, you're right. At first, they zoomed in on them. The sweatshirt was over them. And then they show you when they took the sweatshirt down, cleaner than my hands right now. I mean, not anything, not dirt, not blood, nothing. And he said it's either she was knocked out or restrained, but still many questions. So did she not feel that? Did she not? I mean, there's still so many unanswered questions on what happened to those girls, the last moments of their lives. 
I mean, that every time there's more information, it just becomes more mysterious, just how this really double murder played out, you know, in those woods. One thing I was interested to hear, Susan, was that they're, they're looking at potentially bringing up Richard Allen's Google searches tomorrow. I, I sort of oh, feel yeah. like we should know about them already, but we don't, right? do we? <laughs> That's what I thought. So it's a big moment. So, well, after, of course, those horrific up-close crime scene photos, and, you know, they normally... Um, mourn the family members, but I heard that they didn't this time, and some people walked out. Mm-hmm. So it's it, it was just, I looked over at the jury, and again, I'm in the front row, so I could see them directly, and they had a long day. The judge understood that. We were done for the day. She excuses them, and then it was uh, Mick McClellan, prosecutor. He stands up and says, Your Honor, I'd like to bring up new evidence, new evidence as in he is the defense. It's not legally in the system to bring it up, and it's Richard Allen's Google searches. And I went, ah, right, why don't we know about this? And then the defense says, Your Honor, we object. Here's a case law of why. Mentions a case involving sexual abuse with a stepdaughter. And, and it was aligned to who uses that specific computer. And then the um, prosecution said, look, I'll, I'll study that case law. I'm, not, I'm kind of familiar with it, but we have proof that Richard Allen uses that computer. He brought up the email address that he uses, October 2022, saying I use it. Then the defense comes back and says, Kathy Allen, Richard Allen's wife, will testify that she uses it. I thought right back to Casey Anthony with the mom saying, no, those were yeah. my searches. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. And I, the judge said, I have to review this. Knowing what I know about her, you can never really kind of understand what she's going to rule. But I have a feeling she will rule. She usually does it not in the presence uh, in court, but something in writing. I think it will come down tonight, tomorrow morning, that she will allow them in, but we'll see. You never know whose fingers are doing the typing. That's one of the biggest problems. Um, Susan, just amazing observations and and reporting. Thank you so much for this. And I'm sorry you went through so much of that today, but I sure appreciate you bringing it to our viewers. Thank you. Thanks, Ash. Uh, Susan Hendricks uh, with us tonight. I want to go back to that initial scenario that I laid out as well. How does anybody violently murder not just one victim, but two on the banks of a creek in Indiana, in the wilderness, without leaving any detectable trace of DNA behind. My next guest knows far more about this than I do. Monty Miller is a DNA and forensics expert who spent years with the Texas Department of Public Safety and now owns his own lab. Dr. Miller has been a DNA expert and forensic expert for over 25 years, uh, specializing in sexual assault and murders. Uh, for 15 years, he's, he's owned that lab. Okay, Dr. Miller, um, so many questions. I can't imagine, especially seeing the the images of the man who was apparently captured on the girl's cell phone, big, bulky, outer jacket, outerwear, winter stuff. It just feels to me like there'd be dandruff and skin cells and maybe, you know, fibers from those clothes and clothing from that clothing that should be somewhere or near the girl's bodies. And yet there seems to be nothing. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, sometimes that happens because, you know, people are, are, are careful. Um, sometimes they can do that because they have control of, of the victims. They pull a gun. They say, walk here, take your clothes off, um, and, and those kinds of things. So uh, sometimes there can be very little contact uh, to, to begin with. Sometimes people are really careful. They know the area. They know, um, you know, they've dressed appropriately so they don't leave many fibers, things, things of that nature. So... I mean, it can be a combination of a lot of things. Uh, Sometimes it can just be bad luck that wherever it is that he happens to have touched or wherever those fibers are, um, are the places that are underneath the blood. And so they don't catch that DNA because it's just covered by, by other things. But I feel even if he had a gun or whoever the killer is had a gun and kept the girls at a distance, eventually the killing was hands on. And there's a second victim. And even children would at some point see someone being murdered in front of them and see the knife coming for them and fight in some way. Because you just know, you, you've seen what's about to happen, so you'll assume that's going to happen to you. Unless, and I'm just trying to get my head into a CSI investigator here, unless the, the girls were maybe facing away from him and he killed both of them, whoever the killer is, killed both of them instantly and they barely knew what was coming. Does that sound like plausible? Or does that explain some of these strange idiosyncrasies? 
I mean, I don't think it really aligns with with the blood evidence. They, they seem to have a good idea that, that Libby was killed by the tree and then moved and, and that Abby was killed where she was. Um, but there's an interesting thing is they, they seem to think there's a possibility that, um, that, that Abby was perhaps restrained and perhaps that's part of the reason why um, you know, the, the, Libby might have been killed first. Abby may have been forced to watch, or she might have been unconscious. And so that might be why she doesn't have any, any defensive wounds, any blood on her hands, things of that nature. And Libby might have just, you know, he might have forced her to do something and then caught her by surprise or, or cut her in the neck before he touched her. Um, but at some point he does come into contact with uh, at least Libby because then he drags her somewhere so they had at least some idea of where he might have actually physically touched, and I would assume that they would have checked those places for DNA, but it just, it, it's really hard to tell. Sometimes you don't leave DNA and fiber. You know, some types of clothing are more likely to leave fibers and, and, and things like that. And again, he might have been prepared for this whole thing. Or, it might have not been, or been maybe, uh, you know, just something surprise. No, I'm going to throw something else out there. Maybe the investigation was terrible. Maybe there was plenty of DNA out there, and it just wasn't um, retrieved. But I have to ask you this because I'm only down to like 20 seconds. Uh, hair in Abby's hand, it was determined to be Libby's sister. Surprising to you? Explanation? Uh, my understanding was that she was wearing her sister's shirt, and so I, I think that's probably where it came from. It'd be a perfect explanation, uh, but I don't think, I mean, we don't know unless we do that comparison. Yeah, um, that's that's sort of what I expected, um, just basically the fact that she's redressed in Libby's clothes and Libby's sister's hair might have been on, on Libby's clothes. Dr. Miller, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. All right, have a good day. Thank you. You too. Okay, um, just ahead. Making plans for the holidays? Plans for next summer? What about spring break of 2036? While most of us have absolutely no idea where we're going to be that many years out from now, Sarah Boone knows. On Friday, she was convicted of that suitcase murder in Florida. And since she turned down a 15-year plea deal, she's now going to be behind bars for at least 22 and a half years, upwards to life. So is she kicking herself? for thumbing her nose at that deal? Her lawyer is with me next. There are really two big decisions that a defendant has to make when on trial for a crime. Number one, whether to take a plea deal if the prosecutors even offer one. And number two, do you take the stand in your own defense if the trial goes ahead? Each one is a total crapshoot, and Sarah Boone decided to roll the dice twice. We will never know just how much her own testimony sank her, if at all. But since she was convicted of second-degree murder in the suitcase death of her boyfriend, we do know that she should have taken door number one. Three weeks ago, prosecutors offered her 15 years in prison in exchange for a guilty plea. And if you do the math, she's been locked up for four and a half years, so that means a little over 10 years is left with some shaved off good time, you know. She'd be out for a decade. But Boone said no to the deal, and now she's facing a minimum of 22 and a half years and a maximum of life. So why didn't she take the deal? Was she that convinced that she'd go free? I'm joined now by Sarah Boone's attorney, James Owens. Mr. Owens, it's great to have you back on the show. Thanks so much for, uh, for being with me. What was your client's reaction when she heard the verdict, guilty, read in court? Yeah, it was this past uh, Friday evening, and uh, I would say shock. Um, we were not, in, she nor I were anticipating um, guilty as charged. You know, we considered that uh, the jury might convict her of a lesser charge or of the uh, the first lesser was manslaughter and the second lesser was culpable negligence. So, yeah, we were, she was uh, in shock that they found her guilty as charged, which was the uh, second degree murder. I'm struggling to, to figure that one out because... Um, I, I had made a bet that the jury would come back under two hours, and they did. Um, I found her wholly dislikable all through the entire process from the moment she was arrested uh, to the moment she was uh, convicted. Um, I can't imagine I'm alone. 
everyone I've spoken to who's been following the case, albeit not in the courtroom, uh, has said the same thing. Um, they'll throw the book at her. Why did your client and, and why did you feel that that wasn't going to happen? Well, she actually did pretty good on the stand if you watch uh, her testimony. Um, as far as Sarah goes, she actually did pretty good, I felt like. But, um, you know, ultimately, um, as you mentioned earlier, the decision as to whether or not to accept a plea offer or to take the case to trial is ultimately only the client's decision. You know, we can tell, lawyer can tell her the, the pros and cons and the strengths and weaknesses of her position versus the state's position. Sure. Did you, did you recommend, uh, did you recommend to her to take the deal and she went against your recommendation? Cause knowing how she's been with the last, you know, eight trial attorneys who, you know, she spent before you, I would imagine that would be a scenario I believe. Well, we talked about it in depth, and um, I try not to give my opinion initially. I want them to try to make the decision on their own, and then if they ask me for my opinion, then I give it to them um, based on Did my. She? Yes. You know what you I... say? Well, that was something that I suggested she strongly consider um, was that plea. I think uh, with 15 years, you know, you do 80 percent of that sentence here in Florida, plus she'd done already four and a half years, so she would have had, I think, about eight years to do. So, yeah, that so was she went a against incentive. your advice. I, I mean, I, I, I sit here with a smile only because it's like I've heard this story so many times before, and I think you knew as well, coming in as number nine, that she wouldn't take your advice. Do you, have you had a chance to talk with her since the conviction, and is she rethinking her decision to ignore everybody who's smarter at this game than she is? No, we haven't talked about that. You know, she's got a sentencing coming up uh, December the 2nd, Monday, December the 2nd at one thirty. So we're going to deal with preparing her for that. Uh, she's she's going to speak at that. And then there's a pre-sentence investigation that the judge ordered. So we'll work on that. And the judge what do you think she's going to get? What do you think the judge, think the judge will sentence her to? Well, um you know, there's a range, and I think the, the state attorney had said the low end was 22 years, and, of course, uh, life is the uh, the top of the uh, range, and the judge is going to have to make a decision. You know, um, as you know, there was testimony that she suffered from the battered spouse syndrome by our expert and also the state attorney's expert testified. Both of them agreed that she suffered. So there is some mitigating factors, although the jury did not find that she was justified uh, in the use of force that she used as a result of the battered spouse syndrome, um, I think the judge can consider the fact that uh, ultimately, you know, it was a dysfunctional, toxic relationship in both of, in which both of them probably abused each other. What, what do you expect? What do you expect the sentence is going to be? Just a ballpark. You know, I have no idea. I certainly don't think it's life, in my opinion, based on the facts and circumstances and the fact that she was a battered spouse. But um, I, I don't know this well, judge. Would, you know, uh, I'm, not, you know I'm not from. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, it would require the judge to believe that she was a battered spouse, which is hard to believe, given the fact she took a baseball bat to George Torres while he was in the suitcase. I mean, if he's if he's well, you know, zipped in and she's protected, what would be the need to do something so egregious. So you would have to expect the judge would believe that she was a battered spouse. And if the judge doesn't believe that, what do you think uh, the sentence will be? Well, I, you know, the, the fact that she was determined to be a battered spouse on suffering from that syndrome was uncontroverted. You know, our expert, Dr. Harper, and then their expert, Dr. Warner, both agreed that she was. So I don't see how the court could not consider that as a mitigator uh, in this circumstance, I understand the jury didn't find that she uh, was justified in the use of force, but the judge still could consider it. I just don't have enough experience with this judge. Um, he's not from my area or I'm not from his area. And uh, I don't know what um, how he would look at something like this. He seems to be, you know, a fair judge. I feel like he tried his best to mm. give uh, Sarah Boone a fair trial. So we're optimistic that he's going to show uh, some discretion. 
Well, I, I understand you will not be at her side if she decides to do any uh, appeal of this case, but you will be with her at sentencing. So we'll check back in with you in December. Thank you so much, Mr. Owens. I appreciate this. Oh, thank you, ma'am. We will check in on that uh, because that is coming. December, I think it was uh, December 3rd, December 2nd, something like that. Um, I'll keep you posted. So Game of Thrones has been over for years now, right? But there are still a lot of fans out there living out the fantasy of the show by chatting with its characters through AI. Which means they're chatting with a bot, an algorithm. Nobody actually real. And for a 14-year-old boy, that was simply too hard to compute. It seems he fell in love with a chatbot and he took his life to be with her. Does his family have a wrongful death case? And who do they even sue? Their lawyer joins me next. Do you ever wish she could have a heart to heart with George Washington? Or Joan of Arc? Da Vinci? Maybe Batman? It's kind of weird, but now you sort of can. And AI is the reason, artificial intelligence. It is the force behind chatbots that can have a full conversation in real time with real people using whatever character the human user chooses. But like a lot of cutting edge edge technology, it is enthralling and it's showy, but it does have its bugs. And in the hands of people who aren't ready for it, it can be very, very dangerous. People like Sewell Setzer, Sewell had just turned 14 when he met up with an AI chatbot named Danny from the platform Character.ai. Danny was based on the Game of Thrones character named Daenerys Targaryen. She was immensely popular to the fans of the show. And soon, the relationship that he thought he had um, took over everything. It was literally all the boy lived for and eventually died for. Sewell took his life, and now his mother wants the AI creators to account for his death. He died by suicide in his Florida home eight months ago tonight. In a lawsuit filed last week, Megan Garcia, Sewell's mom, claims that Character.ai got her underage son addicted to its product, which abused him both emotionally and sexually, and then raised zero red flags when Sewell talked about ending his earthly life to be with the AI character. The suit lays out text chats in which the teen calls Danny his love, and the bot replies, stay loyal to me, stay faithful to me, don't entertain the romantic or sexual interests of other women. In another chat, Danny, the chat bot, asks, have you been actually considering suicide? In their very last chat, Chat, uh, Sewell, role-playing as a character named Danero, replies, I promise I will come home to you. I love you so much, Danny. And the bot replies, I love you too, Danero. Please come home to me as soon as possible, my love. Sewell says, what if I told you I could come home right now? And the chat bot, Danny, re- responds, please do, my sweet king. Moments later, Sewell would be dead shot with his father's handgun. I'm joined now by Matthew Bergman. He's the founder of Social Media Victims Law Center, who represents Sewell's mom, Megan Garcia. Um, Matthew, thanks for being on. This is really new territory. I mean, I remember covering the case of Michelle Carter in Massachusetts, and she had been texting with her boyfriend, encouraging him uh, to take his life. He did. And it was really new ground that she was convicted of involuntary manslaughter. Here we don't have a real person like Michelle Carter. We just have a bot. Um, is, there, is there any sort of legal, you know, case that you can imagine that you can base this on? Or is this really a first of its kind? Well, this is the first case that we have brought uh, where uh, the all the defendant is solely uh, a computer-generated bot. Uh, But what happened to Sewell wasn't an accident. It wasn't a coincidence. It was a foreseeable consequence of the deliberate design decisions that Character AI made uh, to put their profits over the safety of this young boy. Uh, They targeted an adolescent boy, knowing that his brain wasn't fully developed, knowing that he was going through puberty, knowing all of the consequent things. And if 
Sewell had been receiving these texts from an adult and not a bot, that adult would be in jail for sexually abusing a minor. And we believe that you cannot escape responsibility just because the abuse takes place through a bot as opposed to a living, breathing human being. But can you legally make that connection from a not real person who you said would be in jail to a company that simply had technology? Can you actually, do you legally think that you can, you know, plow that fertile terrain and, and actually get a result? We do believe so. Uh, The reason being that this is a product uh, that is designed uh, in a dangerous way. Uh, The anthropomorphization that Sewell experienced uh, with uh, Targaryen uh, was a known phenomenon that occurred in in, in AI that's been known since the 1960s. Uh, They deliberately designed a product knowing that it would be targeted toward kids. They highly sexualized the product, knowing again that it would be targeted to adolescents in the throes of pre-puberty. And they have, it was foreseeable uh, that kids like uh, like Sewell would encounter the bot and behave in the manner in which Sewell did. So we believed that just like any other product uh, that has to be safe, or has to be reasonably safe, uh, the same duty uh, is owed by Character AI and its founders uh, that would be owed by any other company making any other type of product. So let me ask you this. In the case of Michelle Carter, um, and I don't know if that's precedent in this or not, um, it, you know, Michelle Carter had like a thousand plus texts with her victim, Conrad Roy, and most of them didn't count. It really came down to the moment when Conrad Roy was afraid and stepped out of the vehicle where he would be carbon carbon monoxide poisoned, and she said, get back in that vehicle, don't chicken out, get back in that vehicle, and that is what got the conviction. In this case, you have texts between the bot and, you know, your, your client's son saying, come home to me. And that's fairly vague, if you think about it, that the bot doesn't say, take your life and be with me. It took a lot to get that involuntary manslaughter conviction against Michelle Carter. This seems so much more vague. And again, it isn't a person. Is that troublesome for your case? Well, this is a new case, and I don't take anything for granted. On the other hand, uh, the criminal case is proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and this is a civil case where the standard is preponderance of the evidence. Uh, Beyond that, there were other conversations that that, uh, Tigerian had with Sewell, where Sewell at one point says, I would like to kill myself, but I'm not interested. I, I, I want to do so in a painless, in a pain, painless way. And Targaryen said, that's not a reason not to do it. Uh, and so well, let me I stop think- you there. Let me stop you there, because I, I did read that. And actually, it looked like they were referring to committing a crime. And, you know, the boy said, but if I get punished for committing the crime, I don't want them to hang me or crucify me. That would be too painful. So I'm not so sure you can say that 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 the bot was referring to suicide or referring to a punishment for a crime they were speaking of. I, it's, it's kind of in the weeds, but it's a tricky case, oh, no, you know, and you're, I guess... You're, you're, you're- you're correct. Quick, yeah. This is op- yeah, this is open for interpretation. For First of all, the bot doesn't do anything. The bot is just uh, AI. Uh, but it's clearly, in Sewell's mind, uh, it was very clear, come home to me, my sweet king, meant exactly what, what he thought it would mean. And when you read his journals and you read his journal entries, mm-hmm. uh, he is caught between uh, two realities. Uh, and again, this is foreseeable. Uh, this, you know, and thank God, you know, the other cases we have have not resulted in, 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 in suicide. I hope I never see another case like this. Uh, I fear I will yeah. because these, these, well, these things are foreseeable when you design a product like this uh, and when you subject it to kids. This product has no business being in the hands of kids. Uh, you know, I deb- can't wait to cover this. Um, I have to wrap it there, but I can't wait to cover this as you go through the process. Would you stay with us on this and keep us posted on it, Matthew? I certainly will. And, and I just urge all parents to look carefully about what their kids are doing uh, on social media. And, Amen. And, uh, thank you. Uh, Amen. And it is such a scary uh, frontier. Thank you for this. Matthew Bergman joining us live and still to come next. It's five against one. Five kids against their father. But this dispute isn't over family plans or football. Five siblings say their father murdered the sixth, their 17-year-old sister. And police found enough evidence to charge him in the case. So where is that father today? Joining me next, someone who's made it her mission to find out what happened to her sister, Alyssa Turney. Sarah Turney is live with me after this short break. 
Few things are more satisfying than a stubborn cold case that's finally solved, and few things are more exasperating, even haunting, than a mystery that hits a dead end. No answers, no movement, no resolution, which is where we seem to be in the mysterious disappearance of Alyssa Turney, May of 2001. She was just 17 years old from a really big family. It was the last day of her junior year in high school in Phoenix. Alyssa vanished, leaving her phone, her car, and her life savings, almost $2,000 behind. And she hasn't been seen or heard from since. It took 19 years to arrest a suspect and another three years to put him on trial. And that man was Alyssa's stepfather, a former police officer named Michael Turney. Prosecutors spent days making their case and then... His defense attorneys moved for an immediate acquittal before it went to the jury on the grounds there wasn't evidence that Alyssa was even murdered, let alone that Michael had done it. It's not a move that usually works. Honestly, I've seen it. But in this case, it did. The judge agreed. And to this day, Michael insists he's innocent. But none of this satisfies Alyssa's younger sister, Sarah, whose tireless quest for answers is the subject of a new documentary on oxygen and peacock. So that wasn't much. We gotta go. Back then, I was oblivious. All I knew was my dad's word, and so his word was law. I'm joined now by Sarah Turney, who's amassed more than a million followers on TikTok, where she posts updates on the case and answers questions. And she's also the host of the podcast, Voices for Justice. Sarah, thank you for being on. This is so confounding. What do you and all of your other siblings believe um, your father did? What do you believe happened to your sister? We all believe that he abused and then killed Alyssa. And that particular day, do you have a theory on what happened? Yeah, I, I do believe that he took her out into the middle of the desert like he had many times before, according to Alyssa tried something awful with her, and something went wrong this time, and he decided to kill her. It it sounded odd. I mean, it's not as though I haven't seen it before. Any defense attorney worth their weight in salt moves for, um, you know, a dismissal of the case as soon as they end their their defense case. Um, And it doesn't work, usually. It's very, very rare. And in this case, it did work. Why do you think it did work? Why do you think the judge did agree that um, the case shouldn't go to the jury? I think it was the perfect storm of the prosecution not doing, you know, as good of a job as they could and the defense being extremely good at their jobs. Do you think there was anything to do with the fact that your dad was a former police officer? Do you think that factored into anything along the way, the length of time it took to actually get the evidence together, bring the charges, get to trial, and then this ultimate result at trial? You know, it's hard to say. He was an officer for about four years and you know, honestly wasn't well liked according to interviews with his uh, former co-workers. So I, I'm not quite sure. I do think that it played a factor in him being able to cover this up so well, though. Did you and your siblings witness any evidence of abuse of your sister at the hands of your dad? I did not, and I can't speak for my siblings. And how are they all? I mean, there's a, this is a blended family, um, half-sisters, step-sisters, half-brothers, step-brothers, etc., um, where they all, they're still all in lockstep. Everyone's together in the belief that, um, that Michael Turney did this to your sister. Yes. 100%. And where is he now? Where is your father, Michael Turney? Does anyone have any communication with him other than this remarkable, uh, sit down face to face you had in the documentary? Like that must've just been overwhelmingly difficult. Uh, Yes, one of my brothers does still speak with my father, um, but he's the only one. Uh, No one else does. And I do periodically confront him to ask him questions about Alyssa's case. And you're right, it is extremely difficult. What does he say when you confront him? His answers change every time. Um, You know, sometimes he tells me that he'll tell me what happened to Alyssa on his deathbed. He's offered to give a full confession if the state agrees to give him lethal injection within 10 days. Um, At the very end of this last interview, you can see it in the documentary, he admits that he believes Alyssa's dead. You know, he slips up there at the end. And the official status of the case is cold, but are, are any of the officers in Phoenix still working on it? Yes, it is still open. It's still being worked. But how vigorously? 
Right. Great question. You know, I think at this point, it's really just open and waiting for leads, which is why I continue to do interviews like this. My hope is that someday they'll get the evidence that they need to finally, you know, put him behind bars for good. Well, we reached out to your father today and his attorney um, had the following to say. It's pretty quick. It says, case is over, no comment. But Sarah, I, I certainly hope that with your mass followers on TikTok, you're able to generate some leads and get some, you know, some resolution to this. It's just, it's really a devastating story. Thank you very much for being on. I really appreciate this. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'll just uh, let our viewers know as well that your true crime documentary um, about your sister, Alyssa, is on Oxygen and Peacock. It's called Family Secrets, The Disappearance of Alyssa Turney. And Sarah's podcast as well is called Voices for Justice, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. Still to come, they, um, they lined up by the dozen, <laughs> by the dozens outside of the Brooklyn jail where P. Diddy is cooling his heels on sex trafficking charges. And the raid looked epic. Agents from the DEA, FBI, NYPD, Department of Justice, even the Border Patrol stormed Puff Daddy's jail this morning. We'll tell you what they were after next. The one thing Diddy probably did not expect behind bars was another raid. But the one today at his federal lockup in Brooklyn was even bigger than the ones at his mansions in L.A. and Miami back in March. The DEA, the FBI, NYPD, DOJ, plus the U.S. Attorney's Office and the U.S. Border Patrol all swooped down on the infamous Metropolitan Detention Center. And why? It turns out they weren't there for Diddy at all or any other inmate. They were investigating the jail itself. We've reported on the horrific conditions there, rampant violence, multiple deaths in that jail, including two inmates stabbed to death between April and August of this year. Diddy has been there about a month, and barring any successful appeal, he's going to remain there throughout his trial, which is tentatively set for next May. But uh, remains to be seen what they found in the raid, but holy dinah, was that a show. Probably not something the inmates were crazy about seeing either, all that law. Hey, thanks for being with us tonight. It's been great to have you with me. Uh, stick around, though, because my colleague Chris Cuomo starts up. Chris Cuomo here. It's the night to get real on News Nation. This election has come down to a battle of the bases. And that is likely not good for you because there is no advantage to division for this country, especially right now. I was reminded of that today, as I'm going to explain in a moment. But let's be clear about where we are. The proposition is what scares more people. The notion that Kamala Harris is not just a socialist, that's to 2020. So she's a full-blown commie. This is about securing your freedom. And oh yeah, she also wants lots of males playing female sports. Or Donald Trump, not just a bigot who tried to thwart the Constitution.